Chops Garage is proud to be sponsored by Car Vertical, the largest online database of vehicle information. Use the link in the description down below to find the true history of your vehicle or one you're about to buy. Right, back to the unit. That was a bit of fun, wasn't it? Now, it's unfortunate at this point, I found that they've sent me the wrong sensor. I messaged him the other day and said, what's going on? I've had no feedback from you at all. Wait, I got the message back. Oh, it's Citroen, isn't it? So we fixed something else by the looks of it, hopefully. There's a lot of fixing going on in this episode. Just not, they're not used to that, Pete. Hi everyone, welcome back to Chops Garage. You're gonna have to excuse the recording today. I left my uh, GoPro at home, so I'm using the camera with a recorder on it. Um, thought I'd update you on a few things first. For those of you that are interested in my bagonomics of running an old Jaguar XF, um, those of you that might be new to the channel, this is the XF I got from uh, main dealer part exchange, uh, cheap because it had an engine management light on it. It's done 150,000 miles. It's the three litre V6 twin turbo. And um, it had a full service history, but there were a few problems with it. We found out that the engine management light issue was a, uh, it was a problem with one of the inlet manifolds, plastic inlet manifolds, which we got sorted fairly cheap. We then sold it to another trader who ran around in it for, a, um, he must have had it for about six months or so, and then traded it back to me again. And I'm now seeing if you can run one as a daily without any major problems. Well, uh, you've found out straight away that I've got an issue with the uh, some kind of exhaust leak within the engine bay coming through the vents, which is booked in to be had a look at on that because it needs to go up on a ramp for that. But we also now need discs and pads. We've got quite a lot of vibration through the steering wheel uh, from the front discs and pads. I'm pretty confident they are big old boys. They've got a lip on them and the pads are looking low, I think. Uh, not too bad, but they're looking low. Pads, discs and pads for that, not cheap. It's cost me uh, about all in with the wear sensors and the pads and everything like that, a couple hundred pounds. So, but that's just normal maintenance. We won't hold that against the car. I'm getting 32.5 miles to the gallon out of it. I'm sure you could get more, but I just can't help kicking in both those turbos. It's too much fun. Um, right, on other news, the Ignis Sport, some of you that are more observant may notice the Ignis Sport's not been around for a while. It went down for its MOT, needed a few things, I've noted those cracked um, semi-slick tyres on it, which I've left for the moment because I'll decide whether to do them later on or not. But the major thing that's holding it up is stupid, um, we can't get it through an MOT because of the electric headlight adjusters, they've failed, both have failed on the car. So the headlights can't be adjusted for the MOT with the motors and they have to be if they've got the motors and the switches on the dash they have to be adjusted via it. Now it's been MOT'd we can't go back to changing it to manual either they've got to be fixed. But these are unobtainium. Really hard work trying to find some. I've reached out to people that are breaking Ignis Sports and they've normally sold the headlights already. So I've had to take the part numbers from it. And I've tracked down that this is the same part number because obviously with cars, you haven't got a manufacturer making this part. This is made by, as, as in, you know, Honda won't make it or Suzuki won't make it. There'll be a manufacturer making these things and they supply them and they'll be used on various different vehicles. But it turns out this is used on Rover, is it the 75 I think it was? Um, these headlight adjusters use them and they've got a different fitting here this bar is different but the rest of it is identical so the hopes are um, I've managed to find the Rover ones for like uh, 10 or each whereas the only ones of these I found were in headlights and they wanted hundreds of pounds for them so I found the Rover ones for like um, like I say about 10 or each and I'm hoping what I can do is undo all this and just swap this one pin here out because the rest of it is exactly the same it's just this adjuster here on the rover is a long plastic one and this is a metal one so i'm hoping i have prized one apart and had a look inside well i can show you a second actually because this one is the one i prized apart here you go here's the internal so you can see that it's that metal pin there that's different now i'm hoping the rest of it's the same and we might just have to swap this cog and this pin out um, but it's worth a shot for a tenner a piece. But it's just, just a stupid thing for the car not to be able to get MOT'd on. Um, I have had a look in here and I can't see anything obviously wrong. I can only assume that motor's failed because all these seem to move freely. Um, the circuit board doesn't seem too bad. 
so I can only assume the motor has failed so again the other option might be just to swap the the circuit board and the motor out maybe so we'll see when those bits come but you have to, when you start dealing with these older cars you have to start doing this because too often someone will just say to you you can't get them and that's it end off they don't bother doing any more for you um, Moors have obviously I'm not talking about Moors they've, they've tried to find d different solutions but other garages I know would just say that's it game over you can't get it done you need to go away and do your own research get the part numbers off the of stuff do searching around because these will be shared with other vehicles but this is a risk you have with these older vehicles is stuff's getting harder and harder to get hold of and apparently it's the Ignis Sport is the only one that had these on the rest of the Ignises didn't have it someone else might know differently in the comments but I can't track them down anywhere so that's why the Ignis Sport's not been around hopefully we'll get that back with an MOT on it I'd like to do a track day with both the Ignis Sport and the Suzuki Swift Sport together maybe take my brother along with me compare them back to back on a track day that'd be a bit of fun but first we've got to get it for an MOT haven't we kind of thing again it shows you why as dealers we have to be quite brutal with pricing when we're offering to buy people's vehicles because to get them properly ready for retail you know we can't bodge things and um, it, the, the bills add up really quite quickly so that was a cheap car but its retail value is probably two and a half at its best and if we put the tires on it I get those motors done there was a few other bits and bobs I'll probably in another 500 pounds so the margins will be wafer thin on that which is probably why I keep it for myself Anyway, time to get cracking today. What we've got to do, we've got to change the oxygen sensor out on the uh, Renault Clio next door. So we can give that a wipe out and put it back in the showroom ready for uh, for sale. Hopefully we'll get that one out of the door soon. We've got to give the Porsche 28 a wipe over so it's 100% ready for the weekend. I don't want to wait to the last minute on that. So get that ready for the weekend. We want to get the uh, Cougar I bought, which I haven't done anything with yet. It's got the engine management light on for the DPF. I want to see if I can do a regen via the top done. I've not tried that yet. I don't know if he's got the feature in, in it or not, so we'll, we'll plug it in and see if we can do that. I've got a DPF uh, on-car cleaner to put in it, which I don't think really is probably going to do it. Uh, as uh, many of you say, Royston, uh, you're going to say, chances are what we'll do is take the DPF, sit it up, fill it full of DPF cleaner, leave it uh, overnight or even a day or two, clean it out and put it back on again, which may well do it. But it could be marginal, we don't know. It could be marginal on the DPF, so it's worth putting a DPF cleaner in it, trying to regen, take it out for a good long hot run and see if that clears it. When I sell the cars, I always put a warranty on for DPFs. So um, even if it works for a month or two and then comes back again, it will still be covered. We need to give the uh, Kia seed here a clean off since that's had the clutch on it. Still haven't cleaned it off and photographed it. So I need to get that done today. So that's up for sale because that'll be 3995. That's the kind of car I think is going to sell in the current market. No problem at all. Um, this is booked in to have the alternator fit because I'm not going to have time to do it for the moment. And also the S2000 is booked in to have the caliper done and the emissions done so I can photograph that and put that out for sale. So as always, lots on, let's get cracking. That of course got touched like a baby elephant so I've broken all the tabs on that new one but I'm not fussed because I can seal it back up again. So looking inside, they look exactly the same. In fact, this, this one looks in worse condition. But... It's this here that I want to see if I can change out. If I can change out this, everything else is the same. Look, the circuit board, or maybe I can change the circuit board and the motor out, possibly. But yeah, all the rest of it's the same, so it should theoretically swap over. Right, I managed to strip down the uh, Rover one, get the uh, arm out, so what we can do is also strip down the Suzuki one now and swap this swap this out this is the fiddly bit you've got to get these plastic clips off and running out here to release that and then you can unscrew the the cog and you've got to get the chipboard out of the way because there's a little arm sits underneath this plastic bit here it's a bit fiddly so there we have it the internals from the Suzuki one so there we have it, the internals from the Suzuki one in the Rover one. I know the motor looks rustier, but um, well, this one I think must have failed. But we'll keep the bits from that just in case. I would have liked to swap the whole circuit board over, but it's all soldered into here. So um, if that needs doing, the boys down the road will do it. But yeah, we swapped that, that pin over. I have to use the back cover from the Suzuki one because it's got a square slot there to fit onto that. Um, whereas that one had a uh, sort of three pronged one so we'll put that back together take it down the moors and see what happens 
Now, as many of you are probably thinking at this point, you better test it before you take it down to more. So I've made a little rig up, um, put some little connectors on, some spare wiring here, and uh, we will see if we get any movement. Put you uh, just there, so you can see the arm. See, we've got movement. The motor's moving, so should be okay. So quick little job in between things. We've got quite a bit of uh, clear lacquer left in this can. And every time I've got a bit left over, I hit the TCV van with it, don't I? Because we're trying to lock in the sort of rustic look with it. So just quickly masked up. I'm not going over crazy. I don't mind getting lacquer over the top of the badges or the TCV stickers, all that. I don't mind all of that staying on there and getting a bit of lacquer on it. So just cover the lights and the glass up on it. And uh, yeah, just gradually working around. Still having a real problem registering this. The guy that has the company that does it is, he's got the worst customer service. He's awful. So we're now coming up to seven months since I paid him to register the car. I messaged him the other day and said, what's going on? I've had no feedback from you at all. Wait, I got the message back. Oh, it's Citroen, isn't it? I was like, well, what's that supposed to mean? <laughs> well, that's telling me nothing. Oh, well, they'll take as long as they take to do it. I said, okay, well, I'm getting no feedback from you. I have to chase you every time. Well, I can't give you feedback until there's some news on what's happened. It's like, okay, great. So what do I do? I just wait, do I? Just, yeah, absolutely terrible. I've since Googled it and some other people have had the same problems. Anyway, so I'm not sure what to do about that. But let's get a coat of this on. But just so you know, the process of prepping this so it doesn't peel straight off again is I use G101. Uh, and a scuff pad and I basically G101 and scuff pad it all off and then wipe it down so we've got a keyed surface and a clean surface well there it is in all its shiny goodness now I know this process frustrates a few people because they want to see cars fully restored this being fully restored would hold no appeal to me at all the thing I love about it is the fact it's lived the life and it's got all this stuff on it so if I can lock all that in a lot of people just think it's an excuse for not restoring a car. It just has, like my MGB, has no appeal to me to have a fully restored vehicle because I'll be afraid to use it and it won't have any character at all. Right, time to get onto the Clio now. So if you remember this one through an oxygen sensor on a test drive. So it was all 100% prepped, then through an oxygen sensor. Um, so we've got that to replace. We'll need to jack it up on this side. I think it's on this side, we'll double check. It's the post-cat one, which means on the cars you have two sensors normally. Pre-cat, which is on the manifold in the engine bay. And then post-cat, which is on the exhaust system underneath. So the pre-cat are nice because they're easy to swap out in the engine bay. But these you'll have to jack out to swap it out. So we've got the jack and the axle stand in place, obviously. Plus another jack just to catch at the front. We're looking for where this plugs in. And it looks like it's going to be up here somewhere. Hopefully that unclips and we don't have to take the heat shield off. Right, so freed it up. That's that bit done. Now we need to get to the actual where it fits into the exhaust and unscrew it from the exhaust, which you can just see there. So it's sitting in the side of the exhaust. That's what we've got to get off next. Now to do that, you can see that was quite close to the uh, transmission tunnel though, I wouldn't have been able to get a normal socket in. I've got a nice crow's foot oxygen sensor uh, socket here. These kits are super cheap. I think this is like 20 quid or something, and you've got lots of different size ones in there. So this basically allows it to slide over the wire first before you get to the oxygen sensor, and then we should be able to crack the old one off. Famous last word. So I have to give the socket a little dirt the wrench a little dap with the hammer because they are going to be pretty seized in especially if you're working on an older car you need a bit of shock to get it going or work on it when it's hot which obviously isn't as much fun right so that's started to unthread now so we'll just take that out so there's our old sensor out and our new one to go in now I have opted for a manufacturer's fit you can get aftermarket but they can be very hit and miss so a lot of the time it's better just to pay the extra and get the manufacturer's fit ones because you don't want to go and do it all over again so 
it's just as simple as screwing that back in again and then re-threading the uh, cable up and clip it in and we're going to clear the code. Now it's unfortunate at this point I found that they've sent me the wrong sensor. Uh, let me show you. Unfortunately not until I got as far as fitting it. Should have checked it before round. I should have learned that by now. So I asked for the downstream post cat sensor. I've been sent the pre cat sensor which I'm told is downstream, which it's not, because I, I, as I understand it, all downstream ones are the post ones. So that is the one that's come off the car. has a small little plug like that. And the one I was sent has got a big old plug like that. So that's not going to work. So that's, they're normally a bit funny about taking sensors back as well. So, but I've checked my messages because I always actually do it by messenger with old Bilbo. Um, so I have got it written that I did actually ask for a post cat one in my message, so I'm not sure why I got sent that one, so that's, that's on hold. So I've got the seed all cleaned up, need to get it outside for a photo shoot now. It's come up lovely this one, it was a super clean car if you remember, it just needed a clutch didn't it? I've just got to try and dodge the rain because it keeps coming in short little bursts. So uh, it may well end up getting wet, I can't really avoid that. Trouble is in the winter you have to accept you can't really photograph cars in perfect light. And in the dry all the time, you could say I could photograph in here, but the pictures never look quite as good in here. I don't really like them. So uh, if it's absolutely pouring, yes, but I reckon I can probably dodge the rain and get some quick pics of this one. Should be popular, zero road tax, easy 50 miles to the gallon average. I've got customers who've got this engine, reckon they've got well into the late 60s on uh, long runs on the motorway. Uh, mileage is good, conditions are really good, specs really good, and it's nice looking in this colour. So. And it should be under the magic 5k mark, I think 4995, so should be a good little seller for me this one. So while I'm waiting for the correct um, sensor to turn up for the Clio, uh, we've obviously photo cleaned and photographed the Kia Seed. So what I will do while I'm waiting is change over the door card. I did have it booked in with the guys to do the fix on it, but I thought I might as well have a quick go while I'm here. Um, yeah, this is one we've got to replace the whole piece here. I'm imagining this is where I'll be able to see the fitment for the window. So I'll need to get the window down low enough to see it. Because obviously I've got this one for reference. And they've both got the same bung there. It's got the cable and the, I can see in there the window fit in there. So it must be the same for this one. So lower the window, unscrew it from there, put the window back up, take all this off, pop it over. Either that or actually I think I can just swap the motor over, can't I? Because it's screws there for the motor mind you how does the motor fit onto the I'm not sure how the motor fits onto there I could end up mucking things about a bit there oh, I'll have a little look see maybe no they must come as a hole for a reason so it's not mucking around just get the whole thing off try not to lose screws pain bum thing with this is I've got to get all the wiring loom off so that that can uh, feed through when I take this card off. So that's a bit more hassle than the little Hyundai i10 we did the other day. Okay, so at this point, those of you more knowledgeable about these things will notice my problem here, that I've undone all those screws to try and pull the card off, but of course, it's still connected to the window there, and the window's up there, so I can't get a window down to get to that bolt. So I have taken the motor off, and it looks like it just actually just presses into that little uh, drive there. So if we whip the other one off, we might be able to just simply swap, swap mode. Fine as that as well means I don't have to um, get all this wiring out either. So we'll see. Hopefully, it will be as simple as that. So there's that motor off. So look at the orientation of the sprocket and all that. Same far, is that the same? Just double check. Oh yeah, it's a little bit smaller. But it is the same, so if we pop that into there like that, screw it back into place, and we'll have a quick go and see if it works.
Oh, let's get... Game on. Saved us about 40 quid in labour there. It's taken me about 20 minutes. So we'll whip that back on again. So we just needed the motor. I don't know if that's of any value to anyone. I guess if the cable's broken on the back it could be. We were sticking back on eBay. Right, swap that oxygen sensor out for the right one now. And let's see if we have cured the engine management light or not. So it will still be on there at the moment because obviously we haven't uh, haven't done anything. We'll just get the basic level of ignition on. Right. Scan the old motor. Actually, it's come out of that. Let's choose it ourselves. It's a bit quicker, I find, if I choose it myself for some reason. And then let it find the VIN number. So if we automatically search now, for some reason it seems a bit quicker. Yeah, ignition on. If you can hear someone talking to himself, it's Petey, he's, he's back. Hello Petey, you're back. I just said someone's talking to themselves in the background. It wasn't me. Health reports. Now Petey's telling me, don't be daft James, you're gonna to have to put a catalytic converter in it because he likes to be doom and gloom. So uh, fingers crossed he's not right. So we'll have the code still there. Well, Pete can tell me whether I actually chose the right thing for the code or not, can't you? It's obviously only as good as me reading it, isn't it? Uh, wait for it to finish its complete scan a second, right, 100%. Let's right, so have a look. So, downstream oxygen sensor, open circuit. So it's dead second sensor, isn't it? Because downstream's a second sensor, isn't it? Yeah, okay, he's nodding his head. And then we've got ignition coils, which are memory ones, they're historical. So let's clear that code. Clear the codes. I mean, I'm hoping because it says it was open circuit, since it was just dead completely. Right. So let's try starting her up now then. We got a gear here. Yeah. Boom, she's gone. Hey, look at that, he's so disappointed. I guess it could still come back, couldn't it? Go on live date then and see what he's doing. Oh, right, okay. Okay. This, uh, Pete wants to look at live data. Hold on. Uh, system select. Engine control module? Yeah. Uh, read data stream. Okay. Um, where are we then? Air temperature sensor voltage? No. No, that's not it. Um, gosh, there's a lot here, isn't there? You want the, oh, the lambda sensor? That's yeah, will it call it lambda sensor? Yeah, it should be. Downstream oxygen sensor voltage. That's yeah, what we want, want it. isn't it? Yeah, you want them all. You want, it. You want them both. Pete wants them all. He wants it all on there. Let's see if there's any more down here. Anything regarding oxygen sensor or lambda sensors? I oh, will put those in as well. You'll have to tell me which are the right ones when we get them all up, Pete. Ah, oh, there we go. Upstream. That's the wrong one, but we'll have it as well. Yeah, okay. Okay. Right, downstream heater sensor control 86. Oxygen sensor heating inactive. Don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? Yeah, it's inactive. <laughs> Helpful. Downstream extra oxygen sensor voltage is varying. Yeah. So he's alive then? He's alive, yeah, but is he switched on? How do you mean? Well, he's going to get voltage all the time. Oh, okay. I thought I was learning something then. So what are you looking for? I want you to rev it up and see if it changes when I rev it up. Well, the back, the back one won't move so much. Okay.
Yeah, only a little bit of variation revving yeah, it. Yeah, you won't move so much, eh? Well, we'll run it and we'll see what happens. It's the problem that sees most of the uh, work anyway. Okay. So we fixed something else by the looks of it, hopefully. There's a lot of fixing going on in this episode. Just not, they're not used to that, Pete. I just clean cars now. <laughs> nope, it was just too dead. I've not made it.